Hello, my name is Aidan Cornelius Bell, and I'm here to present some research that Piper Bell and I have been doing around assessment policy transformations. This presentation is going to take a, um, an interesting format, so I've got like a 15 minute front end load, which we know is awesome pedagogically. And then we're going to do a bit of a facilitated discussion, uh, use a little bit of educational technology uh, and really get into the nitty gritty of this in the, in the, uh, towards the end. So thank you for being here. I know this isn't the most exciting area, but actually we think that this topic has enormous potential to change the way that we think about, conceptualize and be in higher education for the better, if it's done right. Before we go any further, we should acknowledge that we meet today on the lands of the Ghana people. Of course, there are many um, people from many different lands around Australia joining us today, uh, and we'd like to pay respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to note that Aboriginal people around the country have been involved in knowledge creation, production, sharing for generations, and that culture, heritage and beliefs of Aboriginal people are still incredibly important today. And, of course, Aboriginal people are some of those people that are often excluded from policy decisions, which is an important space that we really need to think about and address. Australia was and always will be Aboriginal land. So, when we think about higher education, and when I ask people about higher education in my PhD, and when Piper and I have been asking about what assessment policy means, people tend to relate policy to this, um, this thing that corrupts the image of the university. Speaking to people in my PhD about what universities were like in the 1960s and 70s when they were young and going through, or indeed when they were teaching um, in the 60s and 70s, um, the general feel was that universities were this, um, this golden place where possibility was endless, where collaboration was truly realised, where everything was made possible, potential, uh, and this, uh, it, it, it was amazing. And they tended to talk in terms of accessible horizontal structures um, that meant that, you know, me as a humanities researcher could collaborate with somebody in chemistry. Maybe I wouldn't want to do that, but there wouldn't be boundaries to me doing that kind of work. And that there was a real sense of collegiality even between staff and students. But actually, I think if we sort of think back and capture the time, we'll find that for the majority of people, universities were incredibly exclusionary, particularly singular in the way that they focused knowledge and knowledge production, and really benefited a select group of people. And in fact, even those decision-making processes tended to be quite hierarchical. A professorial fellow would often make the decisions for an entire department. And yes, while they might have been chosen from a pool of their peers, they were typically white, male, and in charge of an area that they'd been in for many years beforehand. And so some of these structures and the ways that um, thinking occurs in higher education actually still occur today. And so if your golden age was in fact professors making the decisions, well, I, you know, it's still happening now. But actually, efforts now move us towards reconfiguration. And reconfiguration takes on many names and forms across different conceptualizations in different pieces of literature, which is an important space. And we've been assessing and surveying some of these changes and the ways that language has moved. But the most perhaps pervasive and sometimes contested space here is the term neoliberalism. So as we change and transform in higher education, we're moving towards a more neoliberal, individualized, top-down, authoritarian regime in higher education. And this has very serious impacts on how we know, how we think and demonstrate that knowledge, and how we teach and research in those knowledge systems. So importantly, our investigations and our relationships, our teaching, our learning, our research, are all impacted by this um, individualizing force, by this um, push towards more capitalistic terms and tendencies in the development of human capital, etc. And importantly, I think, and this is the piece that's often um, left to last in conversations in the research, uh, but we found that actually the understanding of power inside these institutions has shifted. So from that, that space of you know, incredible agency granted for a small slither and a narrow few, 
the agency is lost. So even academics that fit that sort of hegemonic perception, that white male um, established <laughs> upper class gentleman typically, their possibility for agency has even been impeded now in these new systems of academia. And so our understandings of power shift. And so here I think we are visited by this age-old question of, well, what is a university for? What does it do? What's the purpose? And I think that we can sort of filter that down into three broad categories. And I don't want to um, spend heaps of time and labour this, but I think we've both decided that actually the way that we learn, the way that we share, and the way that we produce are fundamentally critical things for the way that we collectively understand higher education. And so when we learn, I think we all do that, we learn from teaching and we teach to learn, right? So there's sort of a reciprocity in each of these actions. But importantly now, and particularly with neoliberalism, we're seeing a system where these are more partitioned, these are more concretely defined, and um, often can be quite indistinguishable from one another, even though they're separated by policy, they're pulled apart. So thinking about teaching only roles for academic staff or professional staff, general staff members who are prohibited from now perhaps participating in research um, because of the description of their role. And of course, importantly for students, undergraduate students who are frequently being pulled away from the research skills, those core critical uh, and analytical skills that are developed throughout higher education. So there's these artificial boundaries being being inserted in all of these places. And of course, this um, slide isn't supposed to end here. It's, um, you know, the grey sort of fades off into the distance um, as we think about communities and impact and um, going beyond. So, you know, fundamentally, I think, though, um, this learning, sharing and producing is a very broad thing. So it's not just that there was the, the tenured pipe smoking academic professor, you know, with the reclining in the, in the velvet armchair in the corner of his office, you know, paid to sit there and ponder the universe. But in fact, actually, every member and participant of higher education all around the world in different knowledge systems, different ways of doing and manifesting, and some of those approved and not approved, some of those a little bit cheeky, and others um, very sort of mainstream corporate oriented, all together learn, share, and produce. Obviously there's different words and some contestation that goes on there, but let's just stick with that for now for our conceptions here. So our fundamental function as higher education institutions, and I say our as in, you know, students, staff, community members, everybody is part of higher education. For without the people, the institution can't exist. Without the people, the policy can't be animated, right? So the fundamental function of universities, be that those three things or something else that you may think of, rest on these key things. Relationships, people, places, communities, and of course, the natural world. And those have real impacts on how we do the learning, the sharing, and the production. And of course, so does policy. But policy is a little bit more perhaps arcane in its origin than being um, beholden to a community to deliver on the things that you promised. Policy is more of this um, nebulous idea of this thing that, that sort of conditions the ways that we can operate, but is not quite as connected to, I have a human being who tells me that this is, you know, I'm accountable to this. Okay, so coming back then to, well, how do we learn, particularly in a higher education context? Because we need to answer these questions, these fundamental questions, before we can ask, answer questions about, well, what does assessment look like? And I think that how we learn, particularly taking this conference as um, a provocation for this space, is becoming, it's going back to a more collegial space, but it's also becoming more equitable, open, transparent, um, more, more honest about what it's doing uh, and it shares its thinking with the students who make up the spaces that make higher education possible. But of course, we cannot throw aside that as universities globally, and I'm speaking for all universities now, um, that universities provide a certain experience of learning. And Piper and I, of course, have in our research looked at various ways of the ways that assessment, of course, and learning are conceptualized. Um, and there's not only are there particular knowledge systems that are valued, that are respected and included, and particular people that make up those knowledge systems, but there's also particular ways that we look at 
how somebody proves that they know the thing that's part of that knowledge system. So, for example, and I, you know, actually, in, in spite of um, being from this university, uh, I quite like our assessment policy as it asks us to provide early feedback to students to, you know, to make sure they're on the right track and to ensure that there's adequate and high quality progression towards learning objectives, right? So as an academic developer, I dwell in this space quite a bit. Um, and this uh, idea that assessment should progress us towards some kind of learning objective is a really fantastic constructive alignment, you know, sort of some basic educational thinking. But it's important that, you know, as students receiving feedback, there is a, um, an actionable, tangible, useful thing that comes out of this. And so, of course, these, these ways that we do know, understand and practice in higher education are framed by policy and they expect us to do certain things. But importantly, and particularly for things like emergent student partnership, students as partners, student staff partnership work, there's now a more relational or perhaps spasmodic and a bit nebulous um, of a way of working together. And it's not necessarily conditioned through policy, though, of course, you know, increasingly there are partnership agreements and things like that that sort of give some frames for the way that we work. But there's a care that is needed in this space to really think about how these relationships come together, though we're very hopeful that this is building new spaces of equality and equity for knowledge and ways of thinking and doing. But I think it's very important that we don't just apply this to these novel spaces or maybe not so novel spaces of student partnerships, student staff, students and staff working together and these new classroom learning and teaching relations. I think there are very important and much larger scale messages that are coming out in these spaces. And so through our research, we're finding that um, students' roles are not considered perhaps really where they should be. Uh, and this creates important ramifications for policy design and thinking through this space. So when policy is designed, maybe have a, like a, mo a momentary brain, um, brain retreat from this presentation and go, you know, new policy was announced at my institution. When did I get involved? So how do students get involved? How do staff even get involved in policy creation? And often it's not at that first step. It's not at conception. It's not at, we have this, um, we have this issue and I think we need some policy around it. Let's bring together a group of staff and students to co-design, co-create, collaborate and produce something that works for everybody. Often it's a backroom deal. It's done, you know, uh, outside, behind, um, behind closed doors. And maybe it includes a student Maybe it doesn't, but often the policy gets decided and then it's brought out for consultation. Or in fact, sometimes it's implemented and then we only ever see it as an end user. And that's both academics and students. And yet academics are expected to enact it. Students are expected to enact it and be um, beholden to it. And so sometimes there's even an absence of policy because actually while there might be a policy for that, the inaction of that doesn't happen because people are not informed, they weren't part of its conception or creation, they weren't consulted, they don't know about it and they don't understand it. Right? So there are real problems for policy creation and analysis as well. And so policy implementation is frequently left to an individual. And so, you know, as a tutor in a classroom, I might be working with a student who asks if they can resubmit. And I might go, yes, of course you can resubmit. You know, like, I, I'm really glad to see that you're acting on some of this feedback that I've given you. Um, let's, let's work on that together and let's see, you know, can you get a better result for this? You know, can you apply some of that thinking? But actually, sometimes in the policy, that's not allowed, depending on particular timelines or depending on particular conditions which might affect a certain student, they may not be permitted to resubmit by policy, right? And so good intentions can be overwritten by the way that policy works and actually the other way around because um, to, to a participant's detriment, a tutor might decide on their discretion, no, you can't resubmit that, I'm not satisfied with your progress. And actually the policy says that the student should be allowed to, right? And so we come up with these sort of tensions between um, academic and student agency and then what the policy actually tells us we can and can't do. And we're finding this increasingly across policies across Australian universities that assessment is this more rigid, um, this, this has started from a place of being much more rigid than it was, you know, perhaps in the last 10 years, um, policies got more rigid. Now we're starting to see a new transformation. Get to that in a second. So if we acknowledge that what we do in higher education is we share learning and we expect students to share their learning too, right? So we as academic staff, students uh, as well are expected to create things 
that demonstrate that they've learned a thing, researched a thing, done a thing. And then we share, collaborate, participate in certain new ways. That's then assessed for students and for academics, it's often peer reviewed, etc. And so we're all actually in this together. There is an equality here that everybody is producing and it might be in different levels and it might be acknowledged or unacknowledged, it might be formal or informal, and it might be okay through policy and not okay for the human actors, the human people that are involved in the process. And so we need to really think, and, and this is where we're sort of coming to is, what, what do we do to rethink the students' involvement in policy creation? Because just as in you know, governmental policy creation, it's all too often that the people that are affected by the policy are absent from the policy decisions. Same thing happens in higher education as happens in government, as happens in businesses, as happens in community organisations. The, the voice of some students, or even all students, are actively excluded from decisions that are made about how policy could and should work. And everybody is worse off because of it. So partnership might provide an answer to this. It might provide us new ways of getting towards active democratic participation. Now, we're a bit radical in our thinking here, and we think that, you know, actually using the university as a space to model really, like, robust, academic-based democratic participation is the fundamental new calling for higher education. It's really getting to learn about what my impact can be in society in the, the walls of academia, right? And so by doing that, and doing that in a really clear a really well-defined way, we might have some impact beyond the classroom in new ways of thinking, which creates avenues for the creation, the production of new policy. But we have to be really careful about this and we have to do this in a collaborative mode. So I kind of hinted at rigid to floppy. And what we've been finding is that, so, you know, 10 years ago, assessment policies in particular, which was the focus of our study, were getting more and more rigid. They were being really explicit about, you know, a student can request a remark within three days of receiving their grade, or students may resubmit if they receive between a 45 and a 51. Um, and things like that, right? Requesting remarks, you know, you might have to write to a dean um, and, you know, formally request that you have your assessment remarked by a different marker, things like that, that were really structured and strong and gave students and staff the ability to see and understand what was going on in policy. But now actually we're moving towards a more floppy space. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but again, we have to be careful. So recent policy moves frame assessment as something less rigid. And particularly with COVID, this is a really good thing. It's great. We're moving towards a space where, you know, there is more flexibility and agency in the policy interpretation again. So, you know, sort of, you know, this arc over time of, you know, things getting um, more structured, us realizing the structures don't work and then throwing them out and trying something else, right? But we need to actually learn from this process. And so now, unfortunately, we're getting to this point where we're favoring flexibility in this relationship more than we're favoring um, any kind of procedure. And there's, there's sort of checks and balances in this space that are really important to conceptualize and consider. And we don't have time to dig all the way into all of those right now. But there are some particularly egregious edge cases with new assessment policy. So assessment policies created in the last 24 months that are starting to suggest, and particularly with the oncoming Job Ready Graduates package, that students can simply resubmit their assignments until they get a pass, which, and for you know, high achieving students, that's not really fair. It's like if I see a colleague that submits you know, 250 words for a 1500 word essay, and they just got a pass because, well, like they, they can't fail because Job Ready Graduates would punish them for it, that doesn't feel like my piece of work is being assessed to the same standard. It doesn't feel fair, doesn't feel equitable. But on the flip side of that, you know, there might've been something going on for that student who was only able to submit 250 words, right? And so we really need to think carefully in this space. And we want you to do some of that thinking now. So Piper's gonna facilitate a bit of a, uh, a conversation, but there's also a, uh, a Padlet, so that's just a short link to jump there. So if you go to in.adens.space, forward slash sap, um, you'll be able to see a Padlet with three columns. There's three questions in there because one of them's a bit of a, bit of a synthesis, but we want you to answer uh, any and all of those 
just to sort of give us an idea, you know, fill in as many, you know, as many or as few as you like, but answer for us, how should assessment policy be designed? What's the process of that? You know, if students are to be involved, how should we involve them? And what could be better about assessment? So as a student, as a staff member, what could be better about assessment? Um, but also, how could that play out in policy? What would a really good assessment policy look like? Now, of course, we don't expect you to design a whole policy because those things can be real tomes. Um, but just some, some key things that you think would be important. And then we'll continue to chat. All right, over to you. Jump into that space and Piper will facilitate a discussion. Thanks for listening.